Welcome to my classroom. I am Nestle. In this video, I will try to explain the cardiac action potentials. Basically, there are two types of action potentials in the heart tissue. The fast action potential and the slow action potential. The fast action potential. In the fast action potential, the depolarization phase of the action potential is produced by sodium and in the slow action potential, it is mainly by the calcium ion. So, uh, the voltage-gated channels that open up and let sodium into the cell to produce the action potential are fast-acting. So, the depolarization phase is quicker with a steep slope in the fast action potential. However, the Voltage-gated calcium channels that will open up to produce the slow action potential, the depolarization phase of it, are a bit slow in activating and so calcium gets in slowly. Therefore, the depolarization phase of this action potential is with a smaller slope and hence this action potential is called a slow action potential. So the difference of the naming depends on the difference of ions that produce the depolarization phase of the action potential. Now let us first concentrate uh, on them one by one. I will start with the fast action potential. The fast action potential can be examined in some phases. Phase four is the resting membrane potential and mainly potassium ion is responsible for it, as we shall describe later on. Phase zero is produced by sodium ion. It is the depolarization phase of the action potential. Phase one is a rapid and short repolarization phase, mainly produced by potassium ions again. Plateau as you see here, is the phase two of the action potential. During a plateau, potassium and calcium ions are moving to produce the plateau. And then the third and last part of uh, action, an action potential, a fast action potential, is the repolarization phase carried out by potassium again. This is a very brief summary. Let us start with the resting membrane potential, which is phase four. As we all know, in all cells, resting membrane potential is mainly produced by the potassium ion concentration gradient working through the channels of potassium. So, we have a potassium concentration gradient in the heart muscle as well, but what are the channels that are responsible for the action of potassium to produce the resting membrane potential? Inward rectifying potassium channels are the channels that are responsible for the resting membrane potential in the fast action potential cells. These channels have a private voltage current relationship. If we try to examine the voltage current relationship, here is the voltage difference across the cell membrane. This is what we are going to see for these channels. What does this figure mean for us. This part of this point where the current is zero, where the current is zero, is the ninth potential of potassium, which is about minus 94 millivolts in the heart muscle cells. The part of the curve below the horizontal line means that at membrane potentials that are more negative to the 
Nernst potential of potassium, for example, at minus 100 or minus 110, at, 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 I'm repeating, at membrane potentials that are more negative than the, membrane, than the Nernst potential of potassium, potassium will be moving into the cell. So in any graphic like this, a negative current is telling us that a positive ion is moving into the cell. So this is represented by a negative current. So at water at membrane potentials less more negative, sorry, more negative than minus 94, which is the nice potential of potassium. Potassium is moving into the cell. The aim in this case is that when potassium moves into the cell, the potassium is trying to bring the membrane potential towards its own, which is the equilibrium for every ion. But what about the upper part of this curve? The upper part of this curve says that until a point which, is, which has been measured like something like minus 40 millivolts until a point like minus 40 millivolts, potassium is able to go outward. So in a, in a uh, voltage current um, graphic like this, if the membrane potential is less negative than the nice potential of potassium, potassium will tend to move out and the moving out of a positive ion is given as a positive current. So here, above the horizontal line, we observe a positive current, but this positive current, which is due to the outward movement of potassium, is only present until the membrane potential comes up to minus 40 millivolts. So after minus 40 millivolts, there will be no more movement of potassium outward. Because there's a little outward possibility, with little movement of, of, of potassium in the outward direction with these channels, but a better possibility and the, of potassium to move in the inward direction, the channel is called an inward rectifying potassium channel. But, the, but interestingly enough, the importance of the channel for us is here. The little hump here, during which potassium is able to move outward, is more important for us. Why? The, the membrane potential rarely goes to more negative values compared to the next potential. But during the action potential, it will be able to go up towards less negative values. And this hump part of the uh, channel where potassium will be moving out of the cell will try to bring the membrane potential back towards the next potential of potassium, which is more negative. So these channels, are. we are going to talk about the hump and the effect of it during the third phase of the action potential, which is the repolarization phase. But these channels have for, for now, they are important for the formation of resting membrane potential and if there is any movement trying to bring the membrane potential away from the resting membrane potential level, these channels will move potassium outward and they will try to bring the membrane potential back to the resting membrane potential level. Therefore, these channels are said to be important for keeping the resting membrane potential stable and preventing automaticity in atrial and ventricular cells. Why do I say in atrial and ventricular cells? We have to go back to the figure here. The fast action potential is observed in the cells of atrium, in the cells of ventricles, 
and they are also observed in the cells of Purkinje, which is the conduction fibers in the ventricles. The Purkinje is a little bit different from the others because as we will move on to the slow wave potential, we are going to see that Purkinje has a possibility of producing automatic action potentials because although the action potential in Purkinje cells is in the shape similar to the, to the ones in the atria and the ventricles, Purkinje has some properties that are common with the nodal cells in the sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes. And it can, Purkinje, can turn to become an automatic cell, so which is going to be explained later. But here, that's why we say that the resting membrane potential is constant in atria and ventricles and Purkinje cells. But with the Purkinje cells, there's a chance that automaticity can come about. And this constant resting membrane potential is produced basically by the help of inward rectifying potassium channels. So the resting membrane potential in atrial ventricular muscles and Purkinje fibers are, is mainly produced by inward rectifying potassium channels. The nice potential of potassium in them is something like minus 94 millivolts. However, when you look at the resting membrane potential and when you measure it, you see that it is varying between minus 80 to minus 90 millivolts. This means that the resting membrane potential is not exactly equal to the nearest potential of potassium. So there must be the action of some other ion, which is sodium. So the sodium, there is a very small permeability to sodium at rest. And because of this small sodium permeability, the resting membrane potential is a little bit less negative compared to the nearest potential of potassium. And if you may remember our discussion of action potential in the nerve fibers, this you are going to remember that this is going to result in, in any cell, this is going to result in a continuous movement of sodium into um, the cell and a continuous movement of potassium out of the cell. However, the total amount of charges brought in and out are equal and resting membrane potential in the cells are constant. But this continuous movement is going to cause, uh, it may not be, this, co this continuous movement may not be important if it lasts well, a few seconds, but if, because it lasts throughout all of our life, there, it, th this is going to create a risk that the high potassium level on the inside and high sodium level on the outside is going to change. So, to prevent the changes that are produced with these small sodium and potassium currents, we have our special pump, which is sodium-potassium ATPase pump, that is going to push, the, which is going to bring these ions back to their original positions, where potassium belongs to inside the cell and sodium belongs to outside the cell. And if you, if you can also remember from the same video, sodium-potassium ATPase is an electrogenic pump because every time it works, it is sending out three sodium ions, but at the same time it is bringing in only two potassium ions, which means the cell is losing positivity. So, as a last piece, of information for the resting membrane potential, we need to understand that sodium potassium ATPase, because it's an electrogenic pump, is adding a little to the negativity of the resting membrane potential. So, this is all about the resting membrane potential or phase zero 
of, excuse me, phase four of the fast action potential. Now let us move on to phase zero of the fast action potential. Phase zero of the fast action potential is very similar to the depolarization phase of the action potential in the nerve cells. So, uh, when the cell is depolarized a little bit, voltage-gated sodium channels are going to open. How is the cell depolarized? If you are going to ask how the cell is depolarized a little bit, how do we reach the threshold of the voltage-gated sodium channels? The answer is the intercalated discs. In between all the cells in the heart, there are intercalated discs that contain gap junctions. These, through these gap junctions, small depolarizations will move on to the next cell and bring the cell to the threshold, bring the next cell to the threshold of the voltage-gated sodium channels. After that, the story is similar. Some voltage-gated sodium channels open and the cell depolarizes further. We know that the threshold of all voltage-gated sodium channels are not the same. So with further depolarization, you're going to reach the threshold of even more sodium channels. And this is going to positive, this is going to produce what we call a positive feedback. So as more voltage-gated sodium channels open, we will reach the threshold, the cell will reach the threshold of even more voltage-gated sodium channels, and with a positive feedback, depolarization will increase and increase further. At a point, we will come to, the cell will come to an inevitable level, and after this level, the depolarization phase is going to happen very quickly because Lots of voltage-gated sodium channels are open and we are going to have what we call the phase zero of fast action potential which is produced by the voltage-gated sodium channels in a similar way with the nerve fibers. So in the atrium, ventricular and Purkinje cells for the fast potential Resting membrane potential is about minus 90 or minus 80 millivolts. When the membrane potential reaches the threshold value, which is about minus 55 millivolts, voltage-gated sodium channels, which are also referred to as the fast channels, open with the entry of sodium, the cell depolarizes. The upper level of this depolarization never reaches the ninth potential of sodium. When sodium is moving in, into the cell, it is trying to bring the membrane potential towards the ninth potential of sodium, but the action potential peak point never reaches that. There are, the reasons for this is similar to the reasons that we have talked about in the nerve cells. One is that these voltage-gated sodium channels are fastly opening, as we have told before, but they are also fastly inactivating, closing again. So the duration of the time during which sodium channels are open is not enough for enough sodium to go in and bring the membrane potential to the next potential of sodium. The second reason why we are not able to reach the ninth potential of sodium is that a second group of channels are going to open and these channels will start repolarizing the cell. These channels start opening at a level like minus 30 millivolts and they are going to produce the phase first the phase one of the action potential, the fast action potential. Uh, during phase one, a current is taking place and this current is called transient outward and it is represented as ITO. Transient outward 
current is produced by three different channels. These channels open very rapidly and close very rapidly. So, the, that's why it's called a transient uh, current. What are the components of this transient current? There is transient outward one. This is basically carried out by potassium channels. So potassium is moving out of the cell to produce TO1 current through two types of different channels and it has fast and slow components if you go into the details of it. The, there is also another current, a third type of channel, that produces transient outward 2 current. These channels are calcium sensitive chloride channels. And this two group, the potassium and chloride, are responsible for the rapid repolarization or phase 1 of the fast action potential. But if you consider which one is more important, under physiological conditions, TO1 carried out by potassium ion is more important. So when does the chloride current become important? It becomes important when there is high levels of calcium. So if there is a high level of calcium, this entry of calcium into the cell is going to open calcium sensitive chloride channels. Chloride will move into the cell and repolarize the cell and this is going to shorten the duration of the action potential. Therefore, this mechanism is believed to be a protection against which uh, against high level of calcium. It is like a negative feedback mechanism. So if you have high levels of calcium, the, it opens chloride channels and chloride channels in turn shorten the action potential and this means a smaller plateau and less entry of calcium into the cell. Phase one of fast action potential, or in other words, rapid repolarization, is more prominent in the cells of Purkinje, in the cells of atria, but there's a little bit of difference when you talk about the cells of the ventricles. The ventricular cells on the epicardial side have more prominent phase one, like Purkinje and atria, but endocardial ventricular cells have a less prominent phase one compared to the all other three types of cells. This phase is followed by phase two, which is also called the plateau phase. During the plateau phase, the membrane potential is kept fairly constant because the total number of ions moving into the cell, bringing positive charges, is equal to the total number of ions going out of the cell and bringing positive charges out of the cell. So there is a balance here. The ion that comes in is mainly calcium ion bringing in positivity and the ion that goes out is mainly the potassium ion moving outward, bringing the positivity outward. The total amount of charges moving in and out are equal, fairly equal during the plateau and so the membrane potential does not show an important change. Let's have a look at the ion channels that help the movement of these uh, ions. Uh, calcium movement is mainly happening through L-type of 
calcium channels. These are voltage gated calcium channels and they start to open at about minus 30 or minus 40 millivolts of membrane potential. If we compare them with the voltage gated sodium channels, voltage gated L type voltage gated calcium channels are really slower compared to the fast acting sodium channels. Uh, the end uh, the sodium channels, voltage gated sodium channels, open in just one millisecond and they stay open for only a few milliseconds. They are rapidly activated and rapidly inactivated. But voltage gated L type calcium channels are slower. It takes a few milliseconds for them to be activated, longer than the voltage gated sodium channels. And then when they are activated, they stay open for a longer time. Excuse me, they stay open for a longer time, which is which can be measured by hundreds of milliseconds. Another difference between the voltage gated calcium and sodium channels is that the amount of calcium going in is small. I will go back to this after I explain the activity of the potassium ions. So how do potassium ions go out? Uh, at the beginning of the plateau, at the early parts of the plateau, the transient outward potassium current is responsible for the movement of potassium out of the cell. Toward the end of the plateau, the delayed rectifier potassium channels become activated, they open and they contribute to the movement of outward movement of potassium. So if you think about the channels here, they are transient outward at the beginning of the plateau and then the delayed rectifier potassium channels toward the end of the plateau. So what about the other potassium channel that we know? We, have, we knew about an inward rectifying potassium channel that was responsible for the resting membrane potential. But we also learned that these channels were closing if the membrane potential goes above minus 40 millivolt. So during the plateau, the inward rectifying potassium channels are closed and the, their um, current is represented as IK1. There is no IK1 current during the plateau, but only transient outward and delayed rectifier potassium channels are open. This is important. I told you that I was going to mention this small. More, I was going to explain more about this small event. So because the inward rectifying potassium channels are closed during the plateau, you only have the other two types of channels. This means that the amount of potassium going out is smaller. And then to balance this, the amount of calcium that has to come in is also going to be small. And L type of calcium channels, their number and their conductance are in such a way that smaller amounts of calcium come in. So the amount of calcium coming in during the plateau is small because L type of calcium channels have a small conductance and the amount of potassium going out is also small to balance this because the inward rectifying potassium channels are not at work during the plateau. This is also helpful because if the number of ions changing place during the uh, action potential is smaller then the cell will at rest, when the cell goes to the resting membrane potential, it will have to spend less energy to put these ions back to their normal levels. So we have mentioned that the basic ions responsible for the plateau are calcium and potassium. Um, it may be a little bit of detail to mention, but 
There is also some suspicion that one percentage of the voltage-gated sodium channels do not close, or maybe they close late or slowly, and there may be a contribution of sodium to going in to the cell and contributing to the plateau as well. This is called a window current, but I, I'm afraid we need to wait for more information to come about this. When we are talking about the plateau, we better talk about the sodium-calcium exchanger as well. Sodium-calcium exchanger, as we know, oops, is, um, is a secondary active transport, basically, and if well, the, this uh, transport uh, protein is affected by two things. One is the level of the membrane potential. Second one is the concentration difference for calcium between inside of the cell and outside of the cell. So it's a little bit more tricky to understand in which direction calcium is going to be carried by this protein because there's a chance that this protein can carry calcium outward as well as it may carry calcium inward. So when, you, when the cell is at the resting membrane potential, basically it is easier to understand, the Membrane potential is more negative, so negative membrane potentials make the sodium-calcium exchanger work in a direction of sending calcium outward. So this is the same for our cardiac cells, but as the cell starts to depolarize and the cell membrane potential changes towards more positive values, the, during, towards the end of the depolarization, sodium-calcium exchanger may start to move calcium inward into the cell. What's happening during the plateau to sodium-calcium exchanger it is going to depend on both the calcium concentration difference and the membrane potential. So we know that more negative membrane potentials are on the side of moving calcium outwards. More positive potentials will try to make it move inward. So, uh, and then calcium concentration difference. If more calcium comes into the cell, if intercellular calcium concentration increases, sodium calcium exchanger will try to move calcium outward. What will be the result? The result will depend on the level of the plateau. It's a little bit confusing here because ventricles have a plateau at a more positive value and Purkinje cells have a plateau at a less positive value. If the plateau for ventricles are at plus 20 or 0 millivolts, the plateau at Purkinje cells are at minus 20 millivolts. So this may change the, um, the direction in which sodium-calcium exchanger is going to move. But basically we can say that at more positive potentials and at the beginning part of the plateau, the calcium is going to come inward into the cell. As we progress through the plateau, the sodium-calcium exchanger will reverse its direction and it will start sending calcium outward. So when you have the Purkinje cells with a more negative value plateau, probably the movement of calcium inward will be early in the plateau, but outward late in the plateau, but in the ventricles where the plateau is on, in more, on more positive values, it may be that the sodium-calcium exchanger is working for a longer time to send calcium inward. So I understand that we need more research and more results about what is happening 
in different cells to a sodium calcium exchanger. So we said that calcium coming into the cell brought an equal amount of charge that is carried out of the cell by potassium. After we have mentioned sodium calcium exchanger, we need to add a little detail that towards the end of plateau, sodium calcium exchanger is bringing in sodium because it is sending calcium out. So this sodium coming in by the help of sodium calcium exchanger is also taught to help the, uh, have the positive charges that come in together with calcium. So after this we reach the last we reach the last phase of the fast action potential which is the third phase or in other words, the late repolarization or the main repolarization phase. So during the repolarization phase, uh, we see that towards the end of plateau, voltage-gated calcium channels close and we are only left with the delayed rectifier potassium channels in action. So when you talk about the uh, phase 3, potassium is the main ion responsible and it is moving outward. What are the channels through which potassium is moving outward? Some transient outward channels are believed to be still working, but the main channels are the delayed rectifier potassium channels. These potassium channels, when you compare them to sodium and calcium channels and all other channels, I mean, they are the slowest to activate and they, they are almost none, they, they almost never inactivate. So these delayed rectifier channels uh, have two types. One is the rapid, the other one is slow. And uh, these are the classical ones, delayed, or the, the classical types of delayed rectifier channels, but also there is a new information about ultra rapid ones also. These are not the only channels that contribute to repolarization. There is also inward rectifying potassium channels. If you remember from the beginning of our discussion, the hump, let's draw it here again. So this was the inward movement of potassium and here there was a little hump about the outward movement of potassium until the membrane potential reaches minus 40. So when membrane potential goes down towards the resting membrane potential gets more and more negative at about minus 40 millivolts, the inward rectifying channels are going to start letting potassium go out because of the hump here and they are also going to contribute to the formation of the resting membrane potential. What are the last few points that we can add to the fast uh, action potential? One is that, that the difference between atrial and ventricular fast action potentials. The transient outward current is more powerful in the atria, so the plateau is less visible and if I am able to draw it nicely, the plateau is less visible, the action potential lasts shorter, and these are all due to a more prominent transient outward current in the atria. And therefore, the duration of action potential in the atria is something like 
200 milliseconds, whereas the duration in the ventricles is about 300 milliseconds. One last information that we can talk about is the, how, what about the slope of repolarization compared with the slope of depolarization. The depolarization has a very steep slope, which means it's very quick. Compared to it, repolarization has a less steep slope, which means it is slower compared to the depolarization. Another detail is that this inward rectifying potassium channels, uh, it was found that they are probably gated by magnesium, excuse me, the pen is not good, or polyamines, uh, maybe gating these inward rectifying potassium channels. So this way we have finished the discussion of fast action potential which is mainly observed in atria, ventricles and Purkinje. In our next video I hope to explain the slow action potentials which takes place in sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodal cells. Thank you for listening.